as we are going to understand when this was written, this was written right after the destruction of the temple. And Jews are being dispersed through lost Jerusalem and saying, Listen, this is just not the right time to fill your mouth with laughter. And then the, the Talmud continues as well, when will we be able to fill our mouth with laughter again? And it says, Well, there's the first pastor just quoted. It says, Then our mouths will be filled with laughter. It says, Well, when is that? Maybe it's when the temple is built, maybe it's when the Mashiach comes. It says, No. The verse continues. It says, Then they will say, God has done great things with you. And then we say, God has done great things for us. So when the nations wake up and point to Israel and tell Israel, God has done great things for you, that's when the people of Israel can begin to rejoice again. And so what a beautiful thing to see here tonight, that the people, believers among the nations that are now rising up are now coming to us and saying, God has done great things with you. I don't know if you follow the news, but over 250 rockets were shot onto Israel. And somehow, you know, if we want to see a testimony of divine providence, yeah. no one of our people were killed. There is one picture that I just saw in the video where a rocket fires up and then it does an almost an exact U-turn and it comes back as if it was spun around by the finger of God in mid-air. That's a video that you can just type onto and you can see it with your own eyes. In my life, I've served for over 20 years in the IDF. I have never seen a missile do any of the in mid-air where 250 rockets, each one moved and where it needed to go in order that no one would be injured. I mean, to see the divine providence, just in case we needed to know, you know, because the enemy saw Tisha B'Av, if there's one time where God is sort of looking narrowly at the people of Israel, where it's auspicious for bad times, it's Tisha B'Av. So our enemies come and attack us at our weakest and even then, we can only see that God's love is growing and growing. And Tisha B'Av is called eventually to be a happy day. The Talmud says that the spirit of Mashiach comes into the world on Tisha B'Av. It's like from the greatest disaster, from that somehow, from the darkness, light is supposed to emerge. And, you know, really where, you know, I, I look at this beautiful tapestry here. And that's really what we're, we're mourning after. That Jerusalem was the city of peace. It was the kingdom of God. It's where God's presence dwelled. And then with time, God's presence left Israel and left the land. And the land remained barren and desolate and dry. And then 40 plus prophecies tell us that one day the people of Israel are gonna come back to the land. And not only are they gonna come back to the land, but the land is gonna return to herself. And when I first stepped foot on the Arugot farm, you know, I. I walked past where my staff house is now, and I stood at the edge of the cliff. And you know, in Israel, the, 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 the mountains there are so unbelievable because it doesn't just drop to a valley. It drops to the lowest place on the planet. You can see the Dead Sea from the Arugot Mountain. You see all the way down to the bottom of the world. So the views are like nowhere else on anywhere. And I stood at the edge of the cliff, and I don't know how to explain spiritual things with physical words, but it felt as though my soul leaped out of my body, was doing cartwheels in the air, and then went into the ground, into the rocks. And it was like, oh, whoa, where am I? What is this place? It was like a calling, guard this land. Go to this place. You are connected to this mountain. I don't know how else to call it. And for years and years, my entire adult life, I was haunted by a question. And it was a question that my wife and I, when we first got married, we wanted to answer that question for us. Because we looked at biblical history, and the first Jew is Abraham, first Hebrew. He was the first one. He became the father of many nations. That's the promise in the Bible. He's called Avram to be a father of many nations. And says, well, every Christian looks to Abraham. He's the father of every Christian. Even the Muslims look to Abraham, father of every Muslim. He, that promise in the Bible to be a father of many nations, that came to pass undoubtedly. But Abraham had no religion. He had no doctrine. He had nothing. He was just Abraham. I mean, Moses came centuries later. But Abraham was the first believer to walk that faith, the first Jew, the first representation, our father. He taught us the way without any way beyond all religion, beyond any doctrines. 
And so then Moses came along, and then he gave us rules and guidelines, he gave us Ten Commandments, gave us appointed times, gave us times to worship, time, things to do, things not to do. And then at one point there was a temple in Jerusalem where there was sacrifices with animals and wine and blood. And, and then in that time, I mean, after the destruction, after Tisha B'Av, rabbinic Judaism emerged, and then we're trying so hard to hold on to the memory of the temple, to the temple lifestyle through our prayers to keep Jerusalem as every synagogue in the world is faced to that one place. So in the north, we face the south. In the south, in Africa, every synagogue faces the north, trying to hold on to it. But rabbinic Judaism, and now 2022, Facebook and Instagram, like what is the connection between all of that line, Abraham, Moses, the temple, and here we are today, like the outward expression of those people were totally different. So the question that haunted me was, what's the heart of it? What is the spirit of Israel that has been transmitted throughout all of those times until today? If we can get to the heart of it, if we can get to the spirit of it, maybe we can have a breakthrough. And so my wife and I, and I'm sure there's many answers, but my wife and I came to an answer, and that became the covenant of our marriage, is that you can live a guided life, that God will guide you personally in your life to where you need to be in order for you to fulfill your destiny in the world. He'll send people at the right time. He'll send you messages if you read his Torah. He'll send you spice carts. Spice carts, it's a uh, language we use in the fellowship when Joseph is sent down to Egypt. It says that he was sent down on a spice cart. And the sages of Israel ask, why is the Torah go out of its way to tell us that he was sold on a spice cart? Why is that relevant if he was sold on a donkey or if he went down on a horse? Why do we need to know how Joseph made his way down to Egypt? So the sages say, from that point on, you can notice that Joseph never complains. He's betrayed by his brothers. He's thrown into a pit. He's sold into slavery. He's then sold into prison for a crime he never committed. He never complains. Because that spice cart was a turning point in his life. In his darkest time, when he was betrayed by his brothers, when he was left for dead, sold down to Egypt, on that road was usually sulfur traders. And sulfur smells really bad. And they would take sulfur from around the Dead Sea area in Israel and bring it down to Egypt. And Joseph said, I should have been on a sulfur cart. And all of a sudden, it's like delicious smells here on a spice cart. That's so out of the ordinary. And right there, that spice cart changed his life because he saw that that spice cart was God's signature in his life, saying, in your darkest moments, don't forget, I'm right here with you. I sent you just the spice cart so you would know that you're going down to Egypt now. You're not forgotten. On the contrary, I'm the one that's sending you down to Egypt. And so spice carts appear to us in our life all the time, the things that are just out of the ordinary enough. Just as you're reading Leviticus chapter 26, in comes a rabbi with exactly that. And I usually don't teach with notes. Who knows why I said what I said that evening? I don't know what I'm going to say this evening. And so you just never know. A spice carts arrive exactly when we need them, if we have the eyes to seed them. The heart of every prophet is telling us you can live a guided life. The people of Israel started worshiping the temple itself. Well, we have sacrifices, we have rituals. No, nope. Abraham was beyond sacrifice. Abraham was beyond ritual. Abraham was beyond religion. That's why he's the beginning. To teach us at the beginning, all he had was prayer. All he had was a connection. All he had was a covenant. A covenant, that's really an important word, a breed. A breed means that you are in a relationship. You can't just philosophize about God or theologize about God or just think about God in some sort of scientific terms. A breed means I am in a living relationship. And in that relationship, in that breed, when you're really ready to walk out in faith, you'll be guided. That's the principle. That's the heart. And so when I felt that, I don't know, life-changing event on the Arugod farm, I didn't know what to do with it. So I went back to Tehillah and I told her, I was like, Tehillah, you have to come out to the mountains. There's a farm there in the Dead Sea, in the cliffs, in the mountains. And my soul was doing cartwheels. I was like trying to tell her the story. And she's a very busy woman. She has six kids. She's a full-time lawyer. She teaches at Hebrew University. She's constantly busy. Dad, Jeremy, I don't have time to hear about your farm, your shenanigans right now. I'm too busy. I don't want to hear about this farm. Like another one of my harebrained ideas, this farm. But I didn't, I couldn't stop. So Sunday I went back to the farm. And then Monday I went back to the farm. And then Tuesday I went back to the farm. It's now been almost seven years. And if I was in the land of Israel, a day has not gone by that I didn't make it back to that mountain. 
It was like my soul was stuck in the rocks. I needed to go visit her. I just, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. It's like, we're there. And I just was so drawn to the mountain. Eventually, my morning routine was to wake up early in the morning, drive to the mountain, have my morning prayers in the mountain, and then go off to Jerusalem. And at one point, Teal and I really need to figure out what we were going to do. I mean, we were so called there. And eventually, I got to bring her out there. Eventually, she saw it. And as soon as she stepped out of the car, I mean, some people, it takes them a little bit of time. Some people, they'll literally step off the bus and just start to cry. That has happened. Sometimes it takes them maybe a walk into the cave. Everyone that comes to that mountain is filled with a certain amount of light. It's hard to explain. It's like beyond natural. Everyone that comes is filled with a light. And so as soon as she got out of the car and she saw where he was, we were committed. Okay, we're being guided. This is very obvious, to, but she's just the other side of my soul. We're just two sides of the same coin. And so she felt exactly what I felt. But to move to the farm, I mean, that is really not normal. I mean, it's the edge of Jewish settlement in the land of Israel, at the edge of the mountains, at, into the desert. There was no one. We the last Jews in Judea. I mean, that's, I mean, the world calls that place the West Bank. And they call it the West Bank because they want to evacuate the West Bank. They want to divide up the land of Israel. And you talk about judgment to the nations. If you open up the book of Joel, those that want to divide the land of Israel... Judgment will come upon them. And so we knew that there would be resistance. I mean, to move to the edge of Jewish settlement in Israel will be maybe sued in Israel's Supreme Court. I mean, the army's not going to defend us. We will be alone. The army will defend a community. One crazy family on a mountain, we're going to have to defend ourselves. That's a lot. I have six kids. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's, I mean, I'd be, I'd be that's okay. Well, I mean, my whole life, I mean, I don't even know what the status, I would be a staff house for my property and I'll have to sell my home and just give it all up to this place that may be mine, may be destroyed. I don't know what that means. All of my money, that's a lot. I mean, if we move there with six kids, my kids will come home to a mountain. What will they do all day? I mean, in my little village that I used to live in, we like a suburb of Jerusalem, they had youth groups, they had soccer teams, my brother was their next door neighbor, they had cousins, they had a whole system there. We'll be alone on them, who's gonna play with my kids? I have to play with my kids? That's, okay, that's a lot, okay, I guess I could be a much more involved father. Well, that's a lot, I mean, what if I fight with Tehillah? She's my wife, who will be my friend? I'll be alone on a mountain with my wife? She's a lawyer, that is not a good idea. To be alone <laughs> on a mountain with my wife who is a lawyer, that is not a good strategy. I just don't know, I mean, to move to the mountain, I just, to, I mean, it was a big struggle because I knew that I was being called to walk in one direction, but I just didn't have the courage to do it. And it felt like a, a struggle, it felt like a tension. And it was almost an uncomfortable tension because it was like I'm not really being who I could be. It's like there's this person that I am now and there's this person that I could be. If only I had the courage. If only I had the faith. But I'm not that person now. And so that's sort of like, it's like a judgment on me. Not who wants to live in that judgment. I don't want to feel bad about myself. But it was like a tension. And then, Baruch Hashem, I was given a verse in the Torah. And Jacob is given a name after he struggles with the angel. He's given the name Israel. And it says, for you shall, you shall struggle with men, and you shall struggle with God, and you shall prevail. Therefore, you shall be called Israel. I was like, oh, that tension and that struggle is actually what it is to be Israel. It is to have a destination that's way beyond where you are now, and then walking in that light. Yeah, you're not there yet, and yes, it's a tension, and yes, it's a struggle, and there's a struggle inside, and there's a struggle outside, but in that tension, that is what Israel is. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not ready to move there, but I'm going to do everything that I can to make it happen. So every group that I could, I would bring to the farm. Everything that I bring investors, try to bring donors, try to bring tourism, try to teach people about the farm. And I started learning, what is this mountain? So in the Bible, the mountains are called the mountains of Zif, Z-I-F. It's about 15 minutes outside of Bethlehem. And in the book of Samuel, after David kills Goliath, it says that David runs to the mountains, the wilderness, and the Mitzudot, the caves of Zif. And so that's where David hid. That's where he hid after he killed Goliath. That's where he assembled his mighty men. So in some ways, I mean, those mighty men, those were his elite commando soldiers for the rest of his career. In some ways, the army of Israel was built in those mountains. David became the leader. The kingdom, in some ways, was built first in those mountains. I'm like, that's amazing. And then why did he run to the mountains of Ziph? So I started to study a little bit more. The Midrash says... 
David would take his sheep out in the mornings as a young man to the mountains outside of Bethlehem. So those were his grazing grounds. We have now a flock of almost 90 sheep. We take them out for about eight hours a day. But in the wintertime, you can take your sheep out sometimes for a month at a time, especially if you don't want to supplement their food. So David definitely took his sheep out for more than eight hours. He took them out for weeks at a time, and he took them right out to the mountains of Zeph. So he knew where all the water holes were. He knew where the caves were. He knew how to survive there. So in his time of trouble, where did he go? He went to the place he knew best. So the Midrash then continues to tell us that in those mountains when he was alone, he wrote most of the book of Psalms. And so you think about the book of Psalms. It's really so powerful. Every Catholic in Brazil, every Protestant in Germany, every evangelical Christian in America, every Jew in Jerusalem, when someone is sick and someone wants to pray, they open up the book of Psalms. King David taught the entire world how to pray. And those prayers came into the world in those mountains. And I'm like, okay. Well, that's clearly what we need to do. We need to be building a house of prayer on these mountains. We need to be building a house of prayer on these mountains for all nations, the nations that want to attach themselves to King David and learn how to pray in the mountains where King David taught the world how to pray. That's what we're going to make a mountain that's destined for that, to be a house for all nations that want to come and connect to Israel, not just on the beautiful beaches of Tel Aviv, but in the spirit of the mountains of Judea. And why is that important? Why are Jews called Jews? So some people think that's because we're from the tribe of Judah, but that's not true. The first person in the Bible to be called a Jew is Mordechai. It says, Mordechai ha Yehudi in the book of Esther. And then it says, Ish Yemini, from the tribe of Benjamin. Well, if he's from the tribe of Benjamin, why is he called a Jew? It's clearly not because of the tribe. Jews are called Jews because we're from Judea. Japanese are from Japan. Americans are from America. Canadians are from Canada. Chinese are from China. Jews, we're from Judea. So when the world says, West Bank, occupying settlers, evacuate this political territory, what they're really saying is, Jews, get out of Judea. And that's a little bit harder for the ear to hear, because if a Jew can't live in Judea, where can a Jew live in the world? If a Jew doesn't have a right to live as a free Jew in Judea, then we really don't have a right to live in Tel Aviv. And maybe that's the whole point undermine us all. Every map in the world called those mountains, the mountains of Judea, the desert of Judea, the Judean desert. The Bible calls it Judea. The New Testament calls it Judea. Everyone in the world has always called it Judea. Only now in the last few decades, it's called the West Bank now. But Zechariah says Jerusalem is the city of truth. As the world wants to just erase history, erase truths, erase genders, erase everything that they can to just bring us into total chaos, there's a city of truth. A city of truth that's showing the whole world, watch, my promises that I gave you thousands of years ago, one by one are coming to pass. And Jerusalem has never been so big. There are more people praying in Jerusalem now than ever before. There are more synagogues being built in Jerusalem than ever before. More people studying Torah in Jerusalem than ever before. The world's going to distract you. They're, this vaccine or that vaccine, this pox or monkey pox, this Super Bowl, that distraction and distractions and distractions. That's why every Jew faces Jerusalem when we pray, to realign ourselves, to not get distracted, because God's plan is to unfold in the land of Israel. It is the theater of redemption. And so we said, well, in my and Tehillah's life, that means that we should be, if we want to live a guided life, we should align ourselves with God's plan in the world. He's bringing us back to the land. It started the first Zionist movement. The first city built was Tel Aviv, right on the water. And then slowly but surely, we made it back into the land of Israel, back and more and more into the promised land. When we moved out to the mountain, three nation states sued our farm, four families. Imagine that Norway, Denmark, and Germany paid lawyers from their tax money to try to destroy everything on our farm, our house of prayer, our guest house, all of our trees, our vineyards, our homes, to raise it to the ground. Imagine how irrational that is. I mean, with all that there is to do in the world today, corona, unemployment, inflation, hey, there's some farmers that are Jews that are settling the mountains. If I were to go to the edge of Arizona in the middle of the desert and build a house of prayer and wellness and healing for people, I'd probably be awarded by the governor of Arizona for developing the desert in a place that no one wanted to go to. And here we go out to the edge of the desert 
and nation states are trying to stop us. There's no logical way to explain that other than there is a spiritual war that's at place here and we've awoken some type of monster. Well, we knew that that could happen and that's why I didn't want to move. And then I started to realize, what does it mean to really live a guided life? Like, well, I, wanna, I know that I should be there, so I'm walking in that direction. It's almost like a pillar of fire. That's, you know, there were a million Israelites that left Egypt. So there was a pillar of fire at the very, very front. So for most of us, it was like really far and off into the distance. It was just enough light to give us the general direction. We didn't know where we were going to go. We were just walking off into the desert. How we even got to Israel? No one knew. There was just enough light to give us the general direction to walk that way. That's exactly what Hashem does in our life. He will give us just enough light that we know exactly which general direction we need to walk, which way we need to go. He'll give us spice carts and he'll give us guidance. But the guidance also comes from inside. I really feel it strong when I wake up in the morning. In Israel, I wake up very early. I wake up between 3.30, 4.30, sometime around then. And every morning that I wake up in the morning, I have a voice that pops into my head, and it says, Jeremy, why are you awake? It's so early. Go to bed. Go back to bed. And then almost immediately afterwards, there's another voice. And it's like, hey, Jeremy, get up now. Quick, it's still dark. Everyone's still asleep. If you get up now, you'll have the best day. You'll be able to read. You'll be able to focus. You'll be able to write. You'll be able to plan your day. You'll be a better father. You'll be a better husband. Come on, get up, get up, get up. If you don't get up now, you're going to regret it. Get up. And I'm like, who are these people? And what, are, what, is, what is going on there? Who are those? What is, what is that? That's really confusing because they both speak with I. Yeah. Right? Well, I was like, I want to sleep. I want to get up. Well, who is, who is me? What is going on there? So the Bible really gives us really clear guidance here. It's in the book of Genesis, the very beginning of creation, Shem tells us we were created by earth, by the material of this world. And when we die, we go right back to the earth with, from which we came. And then in the language of the Bible, we also have another side to us, an awareness, an aliveness, this um, God breathed his soul into man. And there are two parts to us. One is physical. And it calls us to the physical. It calls us to comfort. It calls us to sleep. It calls us to food. But there's another part inside us that calls us to God, calls us to truth, calls us to light, calls us to love, calls us to enlightenment. And it's a struggle. And Israel is to struggle with man and to struggle with God and to prevail. It's the struggle with inside us because there's man inside us and there's God inside us. And it's to struggle with that and then to prevail to let our soul be fully revealed. What would it look like if we unshackled ourselves and we just let our soul fully be revealed? Because we have who we are now, and then there is this person that we could be if our soul was fully revealed. So to walk in that light, to listen to that guidance, that's Avraham's calling. He didn't, I don't think necessarily hear it with his ear, he was called, go forth to the land that I will show you. But in Hebrew, it says, lech lecha, go to yourself to the land that I will show you. He says, yes, you have an outward journey in life. Maybe it's to build a business. Maybe it's to build a church. Maybe it's to build a family. Maybe it's to, but lech lecha, as you're going to build God's kingdom, Abraham, just know that whole outward journey, it's an inward journey. You're just going to yourself with the ultimate goal of fully manifesting your soul in the world. And so it was a struggle, and I, you know, got to just couldn't do it. There's too many doubts. But then every once in a while, if your eyes are open, Hashem will send you spice carts. Hashem will send us guidance. And it was five years ago, almost to the day. It was Erev Rosh Hashanah, the eve of Rosh Hashanah. And we went to a preparation, Tehil and I preparing for the holy day. And Rosh Hashanah, that's the creation of light, the creation of the world. It's the creation of man. It's like, that's what we celebrate. That's why it's the Jewish New Year. On the biblical calendar, that's where God had that big bang where he said, let there be light. That's what we celebrate. And so it was Saturday night and the holiday was Sunday. And the rabbi is there and there's music and, and percussionists and guitarists and clarinets and meditation and prayer and Torah all mixed up in one. In the middle of the night, the rabbi gives over a Torah that I'll never forget. And he says, right now is the eve of the creation. So on the biblical calendar, this is still the time when God was dreaming up what he wanted for man before creation itself. So this is the most opportune time of the year to dream. Because in this time, Hashem is literally dreaming with you for what he wants for you and what you should want for yourself in this upcoming year. So dream away. And he starts to play music. And I'm listening to the music. 
And I mean, many of you know this about me already. I have ADHD. I have attention deficit disorder. I cannot dream on command. I don't know how to do that. But I'm sitting in this room, and I'm looking at all these people swaying and dreaming, and I'm so jealous of them. I'm just jealous, you know? I'm like, well, you know, I guess I'll wait for the next one. You know, I guess I missed this round. But I love music, so I'm listening to the music, and my eyes are shut. And, you know, my father, he's a, neuro, he's a neurologist. He's a, a, a doctor of the brain. And no scientist in the world knows where thoughts come from. It's impossible. Consciousness, it's just beyond our, we don't know where it comes from. <laughs> it's something that's beyond. <laughs> dreams, no one has any idea where dreams come from. And in the middle of the night, as everyone's sort of swaying and with their eyes shut, the rabbi says, well, where are you now? Who's with you? Put a little color to it. And he starts to sort of like guide us to make an image in our mind. And I don't know where dreams come from, but all of a sudden an image came to my mind. I have a house on our mountain and my kids are running through the grass. And people are coming from all over the world and they're working in the land and they're learning the Torah and praying in the mountains of King David. I mean, we don't grass in the desert. Like, well, there's not even an electrical line there. Like, how could that even, that's a crazy dream. It's a mountain at the edge of the desert. And I'm like, okay, well, anyway, beautiful dream. Thank you, Rabbi. Beautiful. All right, went to home. And then I'm lying in bed with my wife, Tehillah. And Tehillah turns to me and she says, Jeremy, what was your dream? And I'm like, oh, Tehillah, I had the best dream. We were out on the mountain and our kids were running through the grass and people were coming and our home was open to guests and we're teaching them about Shabbat. It was just so beautiful. She jumps out of bed and she's like, I can't believe it. And I was sure that I had done something wrong. <laughs> and, and she runs into the baby room, opens up the door. The baby starts to cry. She pulls out a notebook, flips through the pages, opens up and throws it on the bed and says, read this. I know that dream. And I opened it up and it's her journal from when she was a little girl. And I met Tehillah when she was 19 and opened up her journal. It's my 18th birthday and I just had the most powerful dream. I'm living alone with my husband on a mountain and our children are running through the grass and people are coming from all over the world to work in the land, volunteer, and learn how beautiful the Torah is. And I'm like, what is this? What is this dream that's unbelievable? I mean, my wife has high heels. She's like a lawyer, a mountain on the farm. Like, that was not, like, what is this? And the last two sentences in her journal, I'm 42, she's 18. I never, didn't even know her then. I don't know how I'm going to get there. I'm going to need a partner to take me. But I believe this is what Hashem has for me in my life. What do you do with that? <laughs> what do you do with that? We didn't know what to do with that. I mean, all we wanted, the covenant of our marriage, was that we wanted to live a guided life. And here we're getting direct guidance in such an amazing way. I mean, before I even knew my wife, Hashem planted some dream in her that she was like a lost, forgotten dream in the journal of a little girl, only to arrive at the place where we're struggling. What should we do? Should we go? What should we do? And here we go. How many dreams did Joseph have? Two. Okay, we got one. Let's go. But then I was like, but what about the security? But what about our finances? But what about our children? But what about my marriage? But what about, what about? And then I was like, well, this is our opportunity to live a guided life. Let's put our house on the market. We put our house on the market, and once the contract was signed, there was no turning back. And then once there was no turning back, it felt like, well, I became white in the last eight months. I wasn't so white. I've been through three wars in Israel. I wasn't this white. It was so stressful, so scary, so overwhelming that it just it broke me actually into, a, it molded me into a new person. And so we sold our house and then all of a sudden we were sued in Israel's Supreme Court by Norway, Denmark, and Germany. That was after I sold my house. I was like, how am I gonna tell this to Tehillah's parents? How, Germany, like, we're going to lose. How are we going to win? Four farmers on a mountain are going to go up against Norway, Denmark, and Germany. Another terrible thing happened, and a woman that had committed to help building our guest house, she got a notice in the mail from, in Switzerland saying the Swiss government has now taxed her 100% for every dollar she gave to Israel. And all of a sudden, the contract that I had signed where I had committed to building the outside of the guest house, I wasn't able to do that anymore. And now I'm in hundreds of thousands of shekels of debt to a contractor because of her not ability to not pass the, I'm like, oh, I'm in all this debt now, and now I'm being sued in the Supreme Court. What are we going to do? 
oh my goodness, I went to my contractor. He's like, listen, if I don't get paid, I'm stopping this project. And I'm like, no, wait a minute, don't stop the project because I have my house to build here, and that's my staff house. I sold my house to build my house, and I will still pay you for my personal house. The guest house, listen, we'll figure something out. He's like, I'm sorry, this was a package deal. If I don't get my money, I'm not building you a house. But, but I have six kids. I have to get out of my house in about another month. If you don't finish, I won't have anywhere to go. Next week, he was gone, and I had nowhere to go. And now I have six kids with all of my stuff, and I have nowhere to move. So for, we're just traveling around Israel, like Abraham and Sarah, walking around. Two weeks in Ashkelon, two weeks in Tiberias. It was summer, so the kids were out of school. We went two weeks to my parents' house until they kicked us out. Two weeks to Tila's parents' house until they kicked us out. And eventually we're like, okay, we have nowhere to go. I guess we'll move to the farm. But to move to the farm, our house wasn't finished yet. So I promised Tehillah that we would have bars on the windows, that we would have a guard dog. We didn't have a door. We didn't have a door. I mean, I'm mean, going to the most dangerous place in Israel with my six children, and I don't have a door. So Ari and I are doing guard duty. From 12 until 3, I'm doing guard duty, walking around my house, protecting my little treasures that are there because I've brought them into this mess. I'm waking up in the morning exhausted with a legal lawsuit in the Supreme Court, another pending lawsuit from my contractor, hundreds of thousands of shekels of debt, and instead of a guard dog, I have a chihuahua. I have a chihuahua that's protecting me, dreidel. That's what I have. And I'm like, how has this happened to me? What is that? What? I mean, what am I going to do? And then I looked at Tehillah, and you know, I was nervous to move to the mountain because I didn't know what it would do to my marriage. It's a lot of stress. You know, we knew we were going to meet resistance spiritually, physically. We just knew, and we're like, all right, well, clearly Hashem is like, He knows, He has faith in us to do this. And I'm like, my wife, and she never complained. It was like a new love emerged from, from me to my wife. I had no idea who I was married to. You don't know how strong something is until you test its limits. And I had no idea who I was married to. You know, because I was clearly sort of a yellow belt in my faith walk, and I had jumped up to play a black belt game in life, and I was just not ready for that because I'm on a puddle on the floor, literally three wars in Israel, and here I am crying myself to bed. Oh, no, what have I done? What have I done? Because I did it to myself. I had a great life. I had a beautiful home in the suburbs of Jerusalem. My brother was my next-door neighbor. I was already in Judea. I was a settler. I had all my boxes ticked. I didn't need to do this. What have I following my dreams? What am I, insane? What am I following my dreams? That's not logical behavior. What have I done to myself? And I'm like cr crying like a little, like a baby in bed. I might as well have been sucking my thumb. And then here is Tehillah, never complaining, skipping around the house. We're following our dreams. We're never going to regret this. I mean, we, we had like a, an extension cord that powered our house. So we could only turn on like an air conditioning and then maybe the washing machine. Oh, you turn on the dryer, forget about it. That, that's just, so we had to turn on the dryer at nighttime when we were asleep and she's never complaining. Six kids with no electricity. Do you guys know what a compost toilet is? A compost toilet. Oh my gosh. And Tila's like, oh, compost toilets, they're so ecological. We should always have compost toilets. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't want compost toilets in our house. I just want regular toilets. And I'm looking at my wife. It's like the rock of Israel. I am like broken and just a puddle of a human being. And my wife is like, if I was like a yellow belt, she's a ninja. She's like this, I, don't, I didn't know who I was married to. So strong in her faith. So like unshakable. And we just, uh, it was... The hardest thing that I, because, you know, when you're not sleeping at night and all the stress, it was just, I just couldn't see a way out. I didn't know how I was going to get out of the mess that I had put myself in. And then all of a sudden, by the grace of God, the Torah portions of the week came. And never in my life, you know, the Torah portions speak to every believer that's reading them. Every Jew around the world gets the same message every week since the times of Ezra. And now so many believers around the world are plugging into the same frequency, the same message is being broadcast, and it speaks to us. Sometimes you have questions, the answers very often will appear, if you're looking for them, right there in the Torah portion. And it's just supernatural because it's answering so many different people in their own personal journeys. And here I am, Genesis chapter 12, learning the stories of Abraham. And Abraham is called, Lech Lecha, go to yourself, to the land that I'll show you. And I'm like, Todd, I'm like, God, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be faithful to that. Like, what am I going to do? And as I'm learning the Midrash, it took a long time for Abraham to get to the land of Israel. A long time. With all of those people and all of that livestock and all of that. I mean, and from the time that he left until he arrived, no communication. Zero. He's just walking in the dark. And so what is biblical faith? It's emunah. Emunah is faith. 
Imun is practice. Same word. It's literally the same root. Imun is practice. Ne'eman, it's the same word, means loyalty. What is Hebrew, biblical faith? It is faith in practice with loyalty. That you have a moment of inspiration, eventually that inspiration is going to go away. Are you going to be loyal in action to the truth that was revealed to you? That's biblical faith. And so Abraham is starting to walk, and it says in the Midrash, the devil himself comes to Abraham and throws every bit of doubt into his mind. And it was as if the devil was speaking to me. It says, you think you can hear God in your life, the devil says to Abraham? You can't hear God. Oh, you did hear God. You heard wrong. You weren't supposed to move there now. You're supposed to move there much later. Oh, you're crazy. You're, Abraham, you're crazy. You're walking into the desert. You don't even know where you're going. And Abraham is riddled with all of these doubts as he's practicing his faith with loyalty, continuing to walk on his way to the land of Israel. And if I were to be the author of the Torah and I were to teach, I were to say, listen, the most important principle is that you can live a guided life. Stay away from the sin. It'll mess up your reception. Walk in the light and you'll really hear well. You can do it. You can live a guided life. So if I were to write, I'd be like, well, Abraham lived a guided life. He got to the land of Israel and he was blessed beyond measure. But that's not what the story says. He arrives in the land. He doesn't enter into debt. He's literally dying of starvation. He has nothing to eat. He has no money. He has no food. Debt is bad. Dying of starvation is much worse. He has to go down to Egypt because he has literally nothing to eat in the land. He's promised to go to the land of Israel and be blessed. He gets to the land of Israel, and he literally has nothing to eat. He goes down to Egypt. He doesn't meet Denmark, Norway, and Germany. He meets another tyrannical dictator, Pharaoh. Pharaoh kidnaps his wife. It's like, what is going on here? Eventually, he goes back to the land of Israel. He's not on guard duty. He has to go out to war for the land. And it's like, what is the Bible trying to teach us here? Live a guided life, and you might die of starvation and have your wife kidnapped. <laughs> like, that is, what is the, that is a terrible sales pitch. That is a terrible sales pitch to teach people to walk a guided life. But I think that's actually the point. It's not a sales pitch. It's just being honest. If you walk a faithful walk, a faith with loyalty in practice, and you live a guided life, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. On the contrary, it actually may even be harder. Because in order for us to fully reveal our soul in the world, it's going to take a lot. But then for our soul to finally be revealed as we walk in that light, Abraham became the person that he was because of all of the challenges and the struggles and the tests that he overcame. It was the challenges in life that built him to become the father of many nations, to become the most influential man in world history. It was all of the hardships that he lived through that built him into who he was. So to live a guided life, Hashem is just growing us. This world was created to flourish. The, just like the trees and the flowers were meant to flourish, we're meant to look at that and say, ah, so too, humans. God created us to flourish like our soul is inside and for it to blossom out. And so, finally, I don't know how, but like one obstacle after the other, obviously with the help of this community here, the fellowship, every single time we've needed help, the fellowship has come just like the cavalry, come in to save us. Unbelievable. Just the deep friendship and loyalty of this community I just love you guys so much. And then somehow we got out of like, like one challenge after the other, removed supernaturally, unbelievably, and we're moving forward. And then all of a sudden, people are coming from all over the world. It's happening. People from Korea and people from America and South America and Africa and all over Europe. And they're coming to the mountain. And they're, it's like our house of prayer is being built. And people would come and they would leave $100. Some people would leave 50 euros. Some people would leave a few shekels. And then we'd get a little bit more cement, a little bit more stone. And then slowly but surely, the mountain that we collected the stones from, the mountain built itself into this beautiful house of prayer before our very eyes. A house of prayer for all nations built by the nations themselves that were seeking to connect to the spirit of King David. It was like, I can't believe it. And then all of a sudden, Corona. Corona. It was like shut down, locked down. You had this purpose. There's no more. No tourism. Not in Israel, not out of tourism. No more. You're just alone, isolated on a mountain now. And I was about to have a panic attack because that was scary. I mean, what are we going to do now? I mean, we have a whole machine. How are we going to water the plants now? And I said, no, no, no. I'm never making that mistake again. 
Tehillah became more beautiful and I became gray. No way. No way. I'm just going to go out to the mountains and I'm going to ask. And I'm going to ask for guidance. What are we to do now? And as I was sitting in the mountains, it really came to me that I had to really confront death. Because I didn't know at that time Israel freaked us out. Corona seemed like it was so scary. And I was like, okay, well, if that happens, all right. So I have one life to live. I have one arrow to shoot. Where am I going to direct it? I says, well, as far as I can tell, the greatest vision that the prophets had was to build the kingdom of God on earth. So that's what I'm going to dedicate my life to. I'm going to build God's kingdom. Now, I might not make it in my lifetime. I don't know. But I'll die trying, and that is a good way to go. Amen. And then I realized that God's kingdom, you know, in, on the Arugod farm, it's like what we're building there. It's most places in Israel, you go to some place of the past, an archaeological site, a holy site, some, someplace old. Here on the farm, we're like building a window into the future. It's like a window into the Messianic era. What would it look like if Mashiach was already here? How would a Jew in Judea live? What would it look like for the righteous among the nations to come to the mountains of Judea with the Jewish people as the stewards and hosts? The priestly nation blessing the nations that come. Can we actually accomplish that? Well, let's build that. And maybe by building a window into the future, we're hastening that future from coming. And I realized, well, God's kingdom, maybe it's headquarters. The capital is in Jerusalem, but it's all over the world. And then all of a sudden, because of corona, we started broadcasting from the farm. And we saw that there's not just a fellowship here in Florida, but there's members of this fellowship all over the world. Believers in the God of Israel that love the Torah, that love the land. Fifty countries started tuning in to this online fellowship. And I realized that the kingdom, the knowledge of God will cover the world like water covers the sea. It's going to be broadcast from the land of Israel. It's going to connect people from all over the world. And the nations, Isaiah says, usually I don't have an insight in the English. Usually my insight is in the Hebrew. But in the English, it says that nations will stream to Israel in the book of Isaiah, stream into Jerusalem. Now, usually in Hebrew, that's like streaming like a river. But just then, the Zoom technology came out, and the nations were Zooming and streaming live to Israel just at this time. I mean, what other way would we be able to bring God's consciousness all around the world? And here, finally, in the book of Zechariah, there's a beautiful verse, because somehow it's all interconnected. The land of Israel, the Torah of Israel, the righteous among the nations. Here's what it says. This is Zechariah chapter 2. Many of the nations will join themselves to Hashem on that day and they will become a people unto me, and I will dwell in your midst. So it's not that there's like people that are like cheerleaders for Israel. No. Many of the nations will join themselves to Hashem on that day, and they will become a people unto me. It's like one organic movement, one movement of the children of God, of believers around the world that come together. Then you will know that Hashem, Master of Legions, has sent me to you. Hashem will take Judea as his heritage, his portion upon the Holy Land, and he will choose Jerusalem again. Somehow, at the edge of Judea, it seems to be that that's a critical part of God's presence returning to the land of Israel. That as the European Union is trying to kick the Jews out of Judea, we won that Supreme Court case. And the Arugot farm has never been bigger, never been more beautiful. And we continue to build with our own hands something physical, but something so spiritual at the same time that God's kingdom is to be built in Israel, and it's going to send light all around the world. I mean, just to get a little bit into what happens on the farm. You know, I've studied um, the writings of the Esh Kodesh, the holy fire. He was the rabbi of the Warsaw Ghetto, who you just mentioned earlier, the Warsaw Ghetto. And talk about a man who was trying to give hope to people when there was no hope, faith to people when faith was hard to come by. And I think about, you know, when he opened his door in Warsaw, what he saw, swastikas and Nazis beating Jews and Jews dying of starvation and being tortured by these Nazis. And he just saw the unleashed evil in man's heart 
with no bar. Take God out of society, and that evil comes out in the most horrendous ways. He saw hell on earth with his own eyes. And sometimes I think to myself, what would happen if, as he opened up his door in Warsaw, the rabbi entered into my eyes, and he opened up and he saw what I saw, palm trees and vineyards in the mountains of Judea, and Judean children speaking Hebrew, shepherding sheep in the mountains of King David, with nations coming from around the world to learn how to pray in Hebrew in the mountains of King David. I think that if he were to see that with his own eyes, he would think he was in the Garden of Eden. He would think that he had arrived in paradise. But what that means is, in the land of Israel, you can already see the Garden of Eden when we squint. You just have to know how to look. And so as the world is going through all of this chaos, a kingdom is actually being built underneath the radar. And it's a kingdom of light. And it's coming to pass, and the world has no say in it. There were 60,000 Jews just 100 years ago in the land of Israel. Today, there are over 6 million. It's happening one step after the other, and it's an invitation for all the people that love this book to watch God's promises come to pass, and then they have a choice to say, well, if God is with Israel, I'm with Israel. Your people are my people. Your God is my God, just like Ruth. And in fact, it was that joining of Ruth as Yom Ruva Goim, and then the nations will say, when Ruth comes and joins Israel, that's what gives birth to King David. That's not just a story, that's a prophecy. And so we should all be blessed tonight that we should know to live a guided life and to work towards building God's kingdom. That's like a common thread that really connects all times, all faiths, all believers, and that we should be blessed to come together in the land of Israel and bring that new light to the world. Believers in God. Thank you all so much. Laila Tov.